safe and effective. Now, where have we heard that before? You would hope that by this stage in history, more people would be suspicious of this contrived marketing slogan. Unfortunately, it is a slogan that is used to cover up immense harm by pharmaceuticals. For those a little more skeptical, it raises a red flag when we hear it being promulgated once again. In 2013, a paper was published in the Journal of Law, Medicine and Ethics titled Institutional Corruption of Pharmaceuticals and the Myth of Safe and Effective Drugs. The authors wrote that healthcare systems are founded on the moral principles of beneficence, non-maleficence, first do no harm, respect for autonomy, and the just distribution of scarce resources. The institutional corruption of healthcare consists of deviations from these principles. They suggest ways that it could be brought back on track, but hint that this is unlikely. In this video, I'll outline another chapter involving the disastrous consequences of mass experimentation with a pharmaceutical product on an unsuspecting population. DES or diethylstilbestrol is a synthetic estrogen that was first made in 1938 by Leon Goldberg at the University of Oxford. Another involved in its development over the preceding decade was British physician Sir Edward Charles Dodds. Dodds promoted the new compound in a letter in the journal Nature the same year and experimentation with DES in both animals and humans commenced almost immediately. It was already known that giving high doses of natural estrogen to animals caused cancer, but that didn't stop the medical industry's enthusiasm for the new compound. Another bonus was that the potent synthetic estrogen could be given orally rather than injected. It was so potent that many of the male workers in the early labs developed breasts and impotence simply from inhaling the lightweight powder. Within months of its invention, it was being put to clinical tests for conditions in which female hormones were thought to be needed. In less than a year, the Therapeutic Trials Committee of the Medical Research Council in Great Britain reported favourably on the use of DES for abnormalities of the menstrual cycle, dysmenorrhea, genital hyperplasia, senile vaginitis and menopausal disorders. It was also used to suppress lactation in women who had just delivered babies. Reports from the United States, France, Germany and Scandinavia were also favourable, although there was some concern about side effects such as nausea, abdominal pain and mental disorders. At the end of 1939, there were also concerns from the American Medical Association's Council on Pharmacy and Chemistry who warned because the product is so potent and because the possibility of harm must be recognised, the Council is of the opinion that it should not be recognised for general use and that its use by the general medical profession should not be undertaken until further studies have led to a better understanding of the proper functions of such drugs. However, there was plenty of hype as a lot of interest in endocrinology at the time was directed towards the role of using synthetic hormones to fix up problems that were thought to be primarily caused by a hormonal imbalance in the body. If there were other female troubles caused by a lack of a naturally produced sex hormone, then replacing it might help. Breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men were then believed to have a relationship with the body's natural supply of estrogen or the lack of it. Hence the development of a replacement hormone might help and it was hoped there might also be other uses for a cheap active synthetic hormone. Of note, it was reported that a gram of natural estrogen cost around US $300, while a gram of DES cost just $2. The possibilities surrounding this cheaply produced synthetic were quickly realised in the United States, as outlined by Diana Dutton in her book, Worse Than the Disease, Pitfalls of Medical Progress. The American pioneer of this use was a Houston gynaecologist named Carl J. Carnegie. The idea of using DES in pregnancy apparently came not from Carnegie, but from scientists at E.R. Squibb & Sons, one of the original DES manufacturers. Carnegie's research had led him to believe that premature labour and miscarriages were due to inadequate estrogen levels and thus might be prevented by estrogen replacement. 
Squib representatives did not have to do much arm twisting to convince him to use free samples of DES instead of natural estrogens. Two Squib researchers came to Houston, fed me and dined me. And I started using it, Carnegie recalled. The initial results were not encouraging. Carnegie began giving DES to dogs, but soon found, as he put it, that the dang dogs were dying like flies. However, Carnegie found more apparent success with human subjects and began using it to stop uterine bleeding with direct injections into the cervix and also to slow uterine contractions with threatened abortions. He presented his findings, which were largely unsubstantiated, claiming that DES was helpful in pregnancy without harm to the fetus. He was reported as saying, with regards to DES, we can give too little, but we cannot give too much. Another example of the medical industry jumping the gun with claims of benefits while complete or long-term safety data is lacking. It is also interesting to note that up until the 1930s, interfering medically with pregnancies was not considered wise by most physicians. In 1938, the US Congress passed the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Under the Act, manufacturers of new drugs were required to submit a new drug application, which included evidence of the drug's safety. However, the Act didn't specify who could provide such evidence. DES was subject to the FDA's approval, and in 1941, a consortium of manufacturers, led by an Eli Lilly's doctor, D. Hines, put forward their case. The group's experts were some of the clinicians who the drug companies had been supplying with DES. The FDA wasn't quite convinced initially, as there were several doctors who had significant concerns with the drug. At this point, the promoters turned to Dr. Alma Severinghouse, an endocrinologist and DES enthusiast. He managed to play down the concerns to the FDA, which helped get it over the approval line. Severinghouse would later become the director of clinical research at pharmaceutical giant Hoffman LaRoche. The major omission from the material being submitted to the FDA was that of animal studies. As mentioned, it was already known that high doses of estrogen led to cancers in animals, but the drug manufacturers failed to establish the safety of the even more potent DES. Instead, they highlighted favorable reports from clinicians who had often been given free samples to try for a variety of conditions. Soon afterwards, it was approved by the FDA for use in various estrogen-related disorders during and after menopause. Dr. Theodore Klump was head of the drug division at the FDA and had been instrumental in its approval. He then spent six months with the AMA's Council on Pharmacy and Chemistry before becoming president of Winthrop Chemical Company, one of the firms that had sought DES approval. Perhaps this was an early example of the revolving door phenomenon that plagues the relationship between the industry and regulators. With regards to safe dispensing, it was thought that limiting the tablet strength to 5 mg and requiring a label on the bottle stating caution to be used only by or on the prescription of a physician would suffice. And of course, the FDA had officially deemed the drug safe and effective for prescribing doctors. In the United States, also in 1941, ER Squibb and Sons, which became the pharmaceutical giant Bristol Myers Squibb, published findings based on patients' clinical reports. In the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology, they stated that more than 257 articles had already been written about DES, including many on its use for pregnant women. Among the conclusions, they claimed, no permanent toxic effects have been reported from liver function studies, blood or urine chemistry analyses, or examinations of blood morphology and blood forming organs. However, highlighting these blood findings was disingenuous, as even by 1939 it had been shown to cause physical abnormalities, mainly of the reproductive tract in animal fetuses exposed in utero. But the march of DES continued, and along with its already established gynecological uses, in 1947, during the height of the baby boom, the major DES suppliers pushed the FDA to approve the drug for pregnancy-related conditions. Once more, shaky anecdotal evidence was presented from uncontrolled studies and simplistic models were employed that assumed the conditions were the result of hormone deficiency. It was known by the stage that synthetic estrogens were carcinogenic in both animals and humans, but the drug companies simply omitted this detail from their applications. 
It was also known that drugs could cross the placenta and reach the fetus, but the FDA officials didn't seem to be concerned about this, and within a few months it was approved for use during pregnancy to allegedly prevent miscarriages, premature labour, and even maternal diabetes. The 5mg tablets were increased to 25mg and then later 100mg doses, and further mass experimentation on even more women began. Bristol Myers Squibb, who had earlier funded the favourable report on DES, was the first to gain approval for the new pregnancy indications, and by 1953, sales were booming. It was aggressively marketed as safe and effective for both the pregnant woman and the developing baby, and was routinely prescribed. The media touted it as a wonder drug, and its use continued to expand. DES was even used to treat what was deemed as excessive height in adolescent girls during the 1950s. While safety concerns were being widely ignored, the effectiveness of DES for many conditions was increasingly questioned. Newer studies that were more soundly designed revealed that giving DES during pregnancy had no advantage over much more conservative treatments, including doing nothing. In 1953, the same year that DES sales were peaking, Dr. William Deepman from the University of Chicago presented a large double-blind study in which his team concluded that the drug had no therapeutic value in pregnancy. However, the drug continued to be used and the pharmaceutical companies made no effort to inform doctors that it was ineffective, while women's magazines also continued to recklessly promote it. Then in the late 1960s, clusters of a previously very rare adenocarcinoma of the vagina were noted by doctors in Boston, all in females under the age of 22. With some deduction, it was established that all of their mothers had been given DES during pregnancy. A paper was submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine, and the journal's editor immediately alerted the FDA. Other doctors also wrote about their concerns to the FDA, suggesting they urgently ban DES and other synthetic estrogens during pregnancy. Medical journals were reporting that the revelation was a time bomb, but the FDA, even with this information in their hands, continued to do nothing. It was only after they came under pressure from a pending lawsuit and a congressional inquiry that in 1971, the FDA finally announced that DES was contraindicated in pregnancy. Over the eight months that they waited, it was estimated that around 60,000 more DES prescriptions were issued to pregnant women. The FDA commissioner, Charles Edwards, bizarrely explained that the agency couldn't act until it had convincing evidence that DES was unsafe or ineffective. As author Diana Dutton explained, his position simply stated seemed to be that drugs were safe and effective until proven otherwise. The behaviour from much of the medical profession over the next few years was less than exemplary. For example, in 1974, three years after it was declared contraindicated, an estimated 11,000 prescriptions were issued to pregnant women in the United States. Some continue to claim, such as in an editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1974, that the risk of vaginal and cervical lesions was still small. And it wasn't until 1975 that the FDA ordered the complete withdrawal of the 25 and 100 milligram tablets from the market. There was also a paternalistic culture that thought it was unwise to disclose too much information to the public. So it wasn't until 1977 that the National Cancer Institute finally published brochures about DES that were designed to go directly to the public. Many of the physicians who had given it to pregnant mothers refused to go back through their files to identify who had been put at risk, and a large number suspiciously claimed that the records had disappeared. DES was the first known example of transplacental carcinogenesis, that is, the development of cancer and offspring due to exposure in utero to a substance that crossed the mother's placenta. Decades later, the number of conditions affecting those who are sometimes called DES daughters has grown to include reproductive tract abnormalities, infertility, pregnancy loss, stillbirth, early menopause, and other types of cancer. Male offspring were less affected 
but have increased rates of genital abnormalities, and some researchers have suggested they are at risk of testicular cancer in later life. Some of the younger of these men will now be around 50 years of age. The mothers who took DES didn't escape problems either and had significantly higher rates of breast cancer. Even after the link with cancer was revealed in 1971, DES continued to be widely used as a morning after pill contraceptive through to the 1980s. This was despite the packaging stating it should not be used for this purpose. With regards to its use in fattening cattle and chickens, this practice was finally banned in the US in the late 1970s, so everyone that ate these meats during that time also had potential exposure to DES. Again, there was huge resistance from the industry to stop the practice, as they dismissed the risks and were more concerned about profit margins. While DES is no longer dispensed in most countries, it seems it is still readily available in China. In fact, a story broke in April 2021 that Chinese wives may be secretly feeding their husbands DES to make them impotent and more faithful. That's not going to be good for business. That's not going to be good for anybody. The authors of The Myth of Safe and Effective Drugs provide a pessimistic view of the industry and conclude that it will not improve until politicians and the people decide they want to stop paying so much for so many drugs of little value and then for treating the millions harmed by those drugs. My feeling is that it is high time for the people to realize that the pathway to health very rarely involves chemicals and other aberrations of nature on offer from the industry. To me, the DES disaster is another example of a pharmaceutical product that tried to create a false market. The original inventors may have had good intentions, but once Big Pharma caught wind of it, they simply looked to get DES into as many women as they could. If you haven't already seen it, then you can also watch my video, Safe and Effective Then and Now, which outlines another similar pharmaceutical horror story. And in our book, Virus Mania, we present the case for how the medical industry continually invents epidemics, making billion dollar profits at our expense. We demonstrate that the trail of evidence points to these alleged health crises as manufactured with nefarious origins. The good news is that the vast majority of us don't need any pharmaceuticals and that realization alone can start a journey towards better health. A sick person often has a deficiency of something, but it's unlikely to be a deficiency of man-made substances. The power of true healing often comes from good nutrition and the processes within us. The answers are found in how we allow nature to make this happen and it's a journey we can all take part in. To help sustain my channel in this time of censorship, please support my work on Subscribestar. Link is in the description. So that we don't lose touch, please find me at drsambailey.com and sign up for my free newsletter.